All right, so we're gonna switch chapters here and look at the chapter on deformation and strengthening mechanisms. So we're gonna take, kind of take what we've learned in the previous chapter about mechanical properties and look a little bit more extensively at deformation, uh, so plastic deformation. Um, and then we're also going to utilize that knowledge and see if we can come up with ways we can strengthen materials and look at those strengthening mechanisms. And so we're going to start uh, this chapter by looking at dislocations and specifically the amount of dislocations. All right, so theoretical strength, if we kind of do some calculations and calculate how strong a material should be, such as a metal, what we find is that theoretical strengths are actually higher than the actual observed strength um, when we calculate it like we did in the, the previous chapter. And so the, the question to that is why? And the answer is dislocations. Um, so dislocations, uh, as you recall from uh, the defects chapter, is a line defect, so one dimensional. Um, they are what enable uh, slip between uh, crystal planes as they move, and it results or produces permanent or plastic deformation. And so the example uh, we give is something like this zinc bar down here. So before deformation, it's a, you know it has a certain shape, and then if we apply a tensile uh, stress to it, it will elongate. And what we notice is that we actually get plastic deformation and it slips um, at these very specific uh, planes. And so we get these little step formations in this material. And if we unload it, it's not going back to this shape. These uh, step, a slip is uh, permanent. And so this will um, regain its elastic or recover the elastic portion, but it doesn't recover this plastic deformation that occurs as a result of these uh, dislocations. Uh, remember edge and screw dislocations that we talked about. So let's review dislocations real quick. So again, linear defects, one dimensional, uh, in which the atoms are misaligned. We had an edge dislocation, which we visualized as an extra half plane of atoms inserted into the crystal structure above, you know, above a certain line. That's where the half plane comes in. And the Burgers vector B was perpendicular to the dislocation line, dislocation line. The screw dislocation uh, was kind of viewed as a spiral planar ramp, uh, which uh, also results from shear deformation. And the Burgers vector was parallel to the dislocation line. So the identity of these two is defined by the relationship between Burgers vector, which is a measure of lattice distortion, and the dislocation line. So let's look at dislocations and the way they move. So for, um, for metals, such as copper and aluminum, uh, dislocation motion is quite easy. It's actually the easiest of the classes of material. And the reason this is, is because we have non-directional bonding, right? So the direct, the bonding is uh, the same in all directions. And so there's no um, preferential direction. Um, and we have close packed, what we call slip directions. So the direction that slip occurs. So these aid in the material's ability to move uh, as a dislocation. And so if we have, uh, you know, this metal, you can think of it again as ion cores with an electron cloud. Um, and those electron clouds are not tied to any particular ion. And so that makes them free to move, which also makes deformation easy. And so when we uh, apply a shear stress like we have here, these ion cores can move past each other uh, very easily. However, if we get to ceramics, uh, this is not the case. So specifically, let's start with covalent ceramics. So something like silicon or diamond. Here, dislocation motion is quite difficult. And the reason that is, is because there's this highly directional or angular bond, right? So this atom has a directional bond with the next one here. And so there's 
it requires a lot of force to overcome these directional bonds. And so dislocation motion is quite difficult. Um, and in a lot of cases, we don't see this uh, in any significant amount. Ion, ionic ceramics are much the same way in that motion is difficult. However, it's not from directional bonding because we know that we have non-directional bonding in ionic. Um, it actually comes from the fact that these species are charged, right? So we have positive and negative charges, our cations and anions. And so if we want to shear this material and produce an edge dislocation, right? Everything is in its equilibrium site. However, let's say we wanna move um, this top row of atoms to the right, right? Right now, this positive ion is surrounded by negative ions. However, if, if we wanna move this positive ion to the right, it would push it closer and closer to this positive um, ion and one above it as well. And so it would push um, similar charges closer and closer together, which is highly unfavorable energetically and, and the force required. And so the, the, the avoidance of these sort of like signs um, is, makes this, difficult, uh, this motion difficult. So when we talk about dislocation motion, we're predominantly talking about metals because of this combination of close packed structures and uh, non-directional bonding, which makes it easy for this to occur. All right, so let's look at the actual motion, this uh, motion of a dislocation. Because again, this is a plastic deformation, so it's all about the way the material moves uh, permanently. And so if we again look at um, an edge dislocation and we want to look at its motion, we call this process slip. And so, um, so plastic deformation occurs by slip. And so again, it's this edge dislocation and it's from a shear stress. So it's like you're trying to push the top portion of a crystal to the right and the bottom portion down here to the left. And so what that does is it wants to move the top portion of the crystal to the right and the bottom to the left. And with that, the extra half plane, which is labeled here as A, would continually move to the right as it breaks uh, the bonds here and here and reconnects uh, here. And so you get, in this case now, the B uh, half plane is the, um, edge, uh, the extra half plane and it continues to move as it goes through the material. And so at the end, you have an extra half plane here at the edge. And again, this is the step motion that occurs, the, the Berger's vector, so to speak. So with this whole process, um, the movement slip um, must occur for this edge dislocation to, uh, to occur. And if the dislocation can't move, then plastic deformation is not e will not easily occur. Right, so that's why it won't happen very easily in ceramics. All right, so let's look at the next idea. So we have these dislocations, edge, screw, or some type of mix dislocation. And the amount of these dislocations in a material is an important parameter for understanding its properties. And so with that, we look at what we call the dislocation density. So how many dislocations are there per unit volume? And so that's what we have here. And since a dislocation is a linear defect, there's going to be a length of dislocation. And so it'll be length of dislocation per volume. And therefore, the units would be length over length uh, cubed. And so it's length uh, one over length squared are the units here. So this is basically a measure of how the amount of dislocations in a material. And so it's the total dislocation length in a volume of material. And again, the units are, are here. So let's look at some reference points. So if we have a very, very carefully solidified metal crystal, so you know, close to an ideal crystal, we can actually still have 10 to the 3 millimeters per meter millimeter cubed right so we have 10 to the 3 millimeters per 
volume. Um, and that's if it's carefully solidified. If we have a heavily deformed material, so if it's got a lot of plastic deformation that's occurred in it, that dislocation density actually increases. Um, and so that can get as high as 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 in the same millimeter, uh, 1 over millimeter squared units. And lastly, as kind of the low end, if we have a single crystal silicon wafer, and these are the kind of uh, high purity materials that are used in uh, integrated circuits, those dislocation densities are really low, but they're still you know, 0.1 or 1 millimeter per millimeter cubed. So even though it's very uh, ideal single crystal, it can still have a very low amount of dislocation density, but obviously nowhere near the 10 to the 9, 10 to the 10 level of dislocation density. All right, and uh, lastly in this module, um, I want to mention you know, this slip process causes plastic deformation, and we have to apply force and energy for this motion, for these dislocations to move and generate. And for metals that plastically deform, you may think that all of that energy that we put in goes into moving those dislocations. However, um, a majority of the energy is not stored in the dislocations, you know, so in the motion. Um, only 5% of that energy is actually stored um, in the dislocation here, so in the strain associated with the dislocation. So we again, we have that extra half plane, so there's compression, and then below there's tension, right? That's the strain, the stored energy uh, from these materials. Um, however, a majority, you know, around 95% of the energy uh, that goes into plastic deformation actually is dissipated via heat. So basically materials heat up during this plastic deformation process.